Collins and it's my privilege to MC this public lecture this evening as part of the Life in Abundance Conference. May I first acknowledge the original owners of this land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respect and yours to the Elders past and present. I want to welcome all of you to this lecture this evening and especially those who join us who haven't been part of our conference for the last few days. It's lovely to have you with us. And it's great for us to have this wonderful opportunity to hear from the Reverend Professor Stephen Bevins. Stephen is a priest of the Missionary Congregation of the Society of the Divine Word. He's Professor of Mission and Culture Emeritus at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. And in the midst of a full life of experiences, he was just telling me how all his weekends are booked up forever. He has published and edited an enormous number of books and as we know, is a writer of great note. Stephen is also proudly a member of the World Council of Churches Commission on World Mission and Evangelization, to which he was appointed by the Vatican in 2014. We are delighted and blessed to have Stephen amongst us here in Melbourne, and I ask you to make him welcome now as he addresses us this evening. Well, good evening, everyone. It is really a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight. Um, this has been an amazing conference. I've enjoyed every moment of it. I've met so many of you. Uh, it's just been really fantastic. And uh, I, I'm just really, really happy to be, uh, to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, as you see, my topic is uh, entitled, my uh, topic of my presentation this evening is entitled, Dreaming of a Missionary Option, Pope Francis's Vision of the Missionary Church. I'm going to try to lay out, particularly from Francis's great document, Evangelii Gaudium, or the Joy of the Gospel, what it might look like if we took his vision of a missionary church seriously. So let me begin. I, on November 26, 2013, Pope Francis published this really amazing document, which is called officially in the Catholic Church an apostolic exhortation entitled Evangelium Gaudi, Evangelii Gaudi, or the joy of the gospel. It has a kind of a tradition. Since about 1974, after these periodic synods of bishops that the Vatican calls about every three or four years, they give over their deliberations, a summary of their deliberations to the Pope, and about a year later, he issues a document called an Apostolic Exhortation. This document, Evangelii Gaudium, was the follow-up of the 2012 Synod of Bishops, uh, the topic of which was the new evangelization. And the focus of the new evangelization, as it had developed through the papacy of Pope John Paul II and Benedict XVI, was basically on what you might call Western secularist cultures. It was a little more than that, but that's how the focus began to narrow in, I would say, the last five or, or six years. Surprisingly, though, Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation acknowledges this idea of the new evangelization, this focus on the West, but 
it seems to kind of broaden its perspective. Rather than talking about new evangelization, he calls for the whole church to be a community of missionary disciples. He only uses this term, new evangelization, 12 times in the document. This is a document of about 150 pages, something like 288 paragraphs. He talks about a new chapter of evangelization, a new phase of evangelization, new paths, new processes of evangelization. Several months ago, I was in Rome at a conference celebrating the document on mission uh, from the Second Vatican Council. And one of the speakers was Cardinal Fernando Filoni, who is the prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. Part of these long, fancy Roman titles. This is the, the world that we're in when we talk about these things. But he says that, if he said in his talk, that in this document, Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis avoids just focusing mission on, you know, going overseas and, 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 and uh, uh, converting people who have not yet known Christ, and also avoids this idea of the new evangelization. But rather, he presses for the widest possible understanding of the church's missionary nature. He says that every form of authentic evangelization is new. And he calls the church, in the words of the Latin American bishops, 2007 document in Aparecida, Brazil, he calls the church to be permanently in a state of mission. A few weeks before this conference that I went to in Rome, Cardinal Filoni said, Pope Francis addressed the Italian government and he referred to Evangelii Gaudium as the plan of my pontificate. So this is a really important document. My I'm not sure, but probably my favorite passage in this document is in paragraph 27, where Francis says, I dream of a missionary option for the church. That is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything say that again, capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably ch channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. I think this is a marvelous, amazing statement that the Pope makes. And what I'm going to try to reflect on this evening is what would the church look like? What would our church look like if we took that dream of Francis, of a missionary option for the church, if we took that dream seriously? And I'm going to reflect on six aspects. I really can't do everything, and I probably have bit off more than, than is even possible. But I'm going to look at six aspects of what the church would look like, pretty much in the words of Amon J. Lee Gaudium, if we took Francis' missionary option seriously. If we did, the church would become a community of missionary disciples. The church would become a manifestation, an embodiment of God's mercy and tenderness. 
The church would become, as Francis has said over and over again, a poor church and for the poor. The church would become declericalized and embrace the centrality of baptism. The church would become a listening church, a church of dialogue. And finally, the church would commit itself to contextualization. So let's look at each one of these in some brief kind of detail. First of all, the church would be a church that is a community of missionary disciples. If we took Francis's option, missionary option, seriously, we would have an awareness that the church's existence is not for itself, but for the gospel. I always tell my students when I teach ecclesiology, the point of the church is not the church. Its existence is not for itself, but it's for the gospel. It is in the words, which Francis quotes in the document, but in the words of the Second Vatican Council, its document on mission, the church is missionary by its very nature. And Francis says that we shouldn't just talk about discipleship anymore. If we talk about discipleship, we also have to talk about missionary. We can't talk about missionary anymore without talking about discipleship. I was in uh, Justin Duckworth's uh, uh, workshop today, and he said pretty much the same thing. He said, a true disciple is someone who has to be a missionary, who has to somehow in her, his life, her, his words, be a spreader of the gospel. Francis says that the missionary task is the duty and privilege of every Christian. And the implication here is that mission happens wherever Christians are, wherever the church is. In kind of Anglican terms, we would have a mission-shaped church. Francis's dream, as he says in, in paragraph 46, he says, I want the church to be a church that goes forth as a community of missionary disciples. And what does that mean? He says, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it's been out in the streets rather than a church that is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. He says this kind of thing over and over again in his homilies, in his talks, and he says it several times in this document, David J. Lee Gallium. He talks about the fact that the church shouldn't be afraid to risk. He says we only really become human we only really come into our own when we have the courage to leave security on the shore. When he's talking about um, uh, contextualization, this is getting a little bit ahead of our, our, our timings, we'll talk about that later, but when he talks about contextualization, he says, you know, the church is always growing in its understanding of the gospel. And he says, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes for the sake of the gospel. You know, he says, even if the church's shoes get soiled by the mud of the street, you know, take the risk. Try to find ways of expressing the gospel in new ways and in relevant ways for today's world. So this safety, security, a kind of a narrow orthodoxy, all pale before the great task of the church, which is to embody and proclaim the reign of God. The picture up here of the sun and the moon 
uh, it is a kind of reference to um, a, 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 a continuous reference in patristic literature, which talks about the reign, the kingdom of God as the sun. And the church is only the moon. The church only reflects the, the light from the sun. And so the church gets its reality from its service of the reign of God, from its proclamation of the reign of God. It's the reign of God, then, that sets the agenda for the church. What is that reign of God? It's what creation would be like if people really let God reign. I love the phrase of um, um, an American Jesuit, Greg Boyle, who works in Los Angeles with, um, with uh, Latino gangs. Uh, and, and Greg Boyle says, you know, it's, it's God way, God's ways are not our ways, but they sure could be. I think that's what the reign of God is, you know, allowing ourselves to, you know, open up to, to God's ways. And so Francis says, mere administration cannot be enough. Throughout the world, let us be permanently in a state of mission. My second point is that if we take Francis's vision of, uh, of a missionary option for the church seriously, the church will become a church of mercy and tenderness. Those two words, mercy and tenderness, appear over and over again in Francis's talks and, and, and homilies. His episcopal motto is miserando aque eligendo, which is actually from a homily of the Venerable Bede, you know, back in what, the 8th century or something like that. And he's, he's talking about the call of Matthew. And he, said, he says that having mercy, he, Jesus, chose him. Um, in an interview soon after he became Pope, Francis talked about a famous painting of the call of Matthew by Caravaggio. That's a beautiful one where Jesus is pointing at Matthew and Matthew is going like, me? You know, it, and, and it's just that, that is a, a, an image that I always have before me. Because he says, I am a sinner. And I've been chosen. Even though I'm a sinner. Miserando. Atque eligendo. In Francis's inaugural homily, he talks about how we should not be afraid of goodness. We should not be afraid of tenderness. This year, 2016, he has proclaimed for the Catholic Church, and I hope it goes out to other churches as well, this is a year of mercy. And this idea of mercy Always come, also comes in Evangelii Gaudium. He talks about how the church needs to be a church of mercy, needs to have an endless desire to show mercy, the fruit of the experience of the power of the Father's infinite mercy. He talks, he uses the term mercy or the word mercy 29 times in the document. Real early on, in the document. He says, let, he says, I say this all the time, says, but let me say it once more. God never tires of forgiving us. We are the ones who tire in seeking his mercy. And so because of this, Francis tells priests, I love this, the confessional must never be a torture chamber, but rather an encounter with the Lord's mercy, which spurs us on to do our best. Now, this phrase, the next phrase I'm going to uh, put up here, is, is not in Evangelii Gaudium. He just said it the other day in, uh, in one of his homilies, but it's the same kind of idea. He says, you know, that we, we shouldn't use a club of judgment. You know, that's not going to bring people back to the church. It's not going to bring people back to God. 
he quotes Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas says this, In itself, mercy is the greatest of virtues, since all the others revolve around it. And more than this, it makes up for their deficiencies. It is proper to God to have mercy, through which God's omnipotence is manifested to the greatest degree. The way God reveals God's omnipotence most is in God's ability to have mercy. And that word tenderness appears no less than nine times in the document. He talks about how God loves us with a tenderness that never disappoints, but's always capable of restoring our joy. Christ makes it possible for us to lift up our heads and start anew. He speaks in the document of encountering evil, I love this phrase, with an aggressive tenderness. Now, imagine, you know, encountering evil with an aggressive tenderness. And in a wonderful phrase that, that I love, he says, the Son of God becoming human summons us to the revolution of tenderness. In the final paragraph of the document, he speaks of Mary. He talks about how we should adapt a, 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 adopt a Marian style of evangelization. He says, whenever we look at Mary, we come to believe once again in the revolutionary nature of love and tenderness. In her, we see that humility and tenderness are not virtues of the weak, but of the strong. And he says that the good news is that each person is the object of God's infinite tenderness. To become a church of mercy and tenderness. Thirdly, if we take Pope Francis's dream of a missionary option seriously, the church would become a poor church and for the poor. It would be a place where, and he's quoting here John Paul II, a place where the poor feel at home, a place that radiates the joy and the hospitality of the gospel. Francis says that the worst discrimination that the poor suffer is a lack of spiritual care. And he says, you know, the church needs to be a place where God's blessing is freely offered, where the poor can celebrate the sacraments and grow in spiritual maturity. And he writes, our preferential option for the poor must mainly translate into a privileged and preferential religious care. I wonder what that might mean for us in our parishes or in our schools or in our hospitals to have a preferential option for the poor and particularly in terms of the spiritual care, the religious care that we offer them. Being a poor church and the need for Christians to live a simple lifestyle are simply requirements of a missionary church that would embrace the poor. And Francis says there can be no excuses. He says, oh, in academic circles, in business circles, in professional circles, even clerical circles, oh, we're too busy, we can't do it. He says, no, there are no excuses for this. We need to become a poor church and for the poor. When he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, and the picture is, uh, him just getting off the subway in, in Buenos Aires. He took the subway all over the city, didn't have his own car when he was archbishop. Francis lived in a simple flat. He took public transportation wherever he went. He, when he became pope, he refused to live in the apostolic palace at, at, at the Vatican. And the, the story goes that he said, you know, they said, well, well, your holiness, why aren't you living in apostolic in the apostolic palace? He says, apostolic palace? Isn't that a contradiction in terms? You know, it's just, 
So, uh, and, and there's a great picture of him, I, I don't have it here, but there's a great picture of him after he became Pope, of paying his hotel bill. You know, just this kind of simple life that he lives. He's chosen very differently from Pope Benedict XVI's red Gucci shoes and all that stuff. He's chosen to, to live or, or to dress very simply. He rides in a very simple car. People were uh, remarking when he came to the United States a couple of months ago uh, how he um, uh, he was in a little Fiat, you know, a little white Fiat. Um, I think this all points to the kind of church that he would like to see and that he calls for. And of course, the church of the poor takes a stance against any kind of greed and any kind of injustice. And as he, as he writes, we also have to say, thou shalt not to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills. So he's very, very strong, you know, against an economy that just pushes people away, uh, that, that just serves the greed of the, of, of the rich and the powerful. And then, of course, a church of the poor will also be a church that protects creation. He writes toward the end of the document, he says, There are other weak and defenseless beings who are frequently at the mercy of, 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 of economic interests and indiscriminate exploitation. I am speaking of creation as a whole. Last May, his wonderful encyclical Laudato Si on the environment was published. And it, it, it's really an amazing document where he lays out the causes and some of the ways that we can participate in reversing uh, what he calls the fact that the earth has become a pile of filth. Last Pentecost, in his homily, he talked very clearly about the fact that the care of creation is an imperative of faith. We come to our fourth point, which is that if we take Francis's dream of the missionary option seriously, we will have a declericalized church because we will recognize the centrality and importance of baptism. The missionary church of mercy and tenderness one that's in solidarity with the poor is called to be a declericalized church. A church that emphasizes the fundamental equality of all Christians because of baptism, which he says is accessible to all. Now, here and there in Evangelii Gaudium, Francis does talk about bishops and priests and deacons and he has a substantial section in the middle of the document on the homily, which in the Catholic Church is basically reserved for the ordained. But it's clear, as you read the document, it's not a document about the ordained. It's a document about all Christians. All, he says, are called to be missionary disciples. He has also coined this phrase now um, uh, to be missionaries of mercy. He's sending out a whole bunch of priests all over the world to be particular missionaries of mercy. But I think it's a wonderful phrase also for, for all Christians. So ordained ministers, Francis says, are at the service of the majority, the laity. And so the formation of the laity and the evangelization of professional and intellectual life, he says, represent a significant challenge for pastoral ministry. The entire church, he insists, and in a special sense, the laity, is endowed with what we call the sense of the faithful. And popular piety, the piety of simple folk, represents this in a particular way. And he says at the end of that section, let us not stifle 
this missionary power of the sense of the faithful. Bishops, he says, are to lead the faithful in a wise and realistic pastoral discernment. They're called to foster missionary communion. He says sometimes they go before the people. Sometimes they walk after the people, helping those who lag behind, but also allowing the flock to strike out new paths. I think for a pope to say that is pretty remarkable. Priests are reminded that the whole point about sacramental power, he says, is in the realm of function, not that of dignity and holiness. The configuration of the priest to Christ the head does not imply an exaltation which would set him above others. Priesthood's key and axis, he says, is not power understood as domination. It's rather the power of service, the power of empowering the church to be the church, to be a missionary church. So there's no place in a missionary church for any kind of privileged class. All have a voice, all share a fundamental equality. And he says even the Pope must think of a conversion of the papacy. So it's across the board. Fifth, the church that takes Francis's dream of a missionary option seriously will be a listening church, will be a church of dialogue. Francis has often spoken about how we have to develop in the church a culture of encounter. And this can only be done by a church open enough to listen, to listen to the real questions of women and men in our world. He wants the church to engage in participatory processes. Um, the last two years, we've had this synod on the family, uh, and uh, Francis really allowed the bishops to disagree with him and, and just to talk as freely as possible. This would never have happened with Pope John Paul II or Pope Benedict XVI. But it's a chance that, that, you know, that the church should be free to, to talk and reflect and listen to one another. He calls the church to respect the sense of the faithful in the entire church, to recognize the Spirit's present, presence beyond the church's boundaries, among nuns, N-O-N-E-S, in medicine, in the arts, in business. God is working, as we've said several times in this conference, God is working beyond the boundaries of the church. To be missionaries, to name that, is to, to, to cooperate with that. For the church today, three areas of dialogue stand out. There's dialogue with states and society, there's dialogue with other believers who are not part of the church, uh, uh, and in other words, ecumenical dialogue. And to these, I would add also interfaith dialogue. He does talk about that as, as well. In terms of the dialogue with state and society, he says it's important to realize that the church doesn't presume to know all the answers. Nevertheless, points to clear values. I, I still think... I think sometimes uh, um, our church thinks it does know all the answers. And for a pope to say, well, maybe it doesn't, uh, uh, is, is really significant. And I think that's a missionary attitude. But nevertheless, we do have clear values, you know, that we have to stand up with. And the pope says it's clear that we have no wish to hold back the, the, the progress of science. And yet, the church maintains the supreme value of the human person at every stage of life. In ecumenical dialogue, of course, this is a picture of uh, Olaf Fixitz-Veit, who is the, uh, the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. 
In that commendable dialogue, Francis calls for Christians to trust one another as fellow pilgrims. I think that word pilgrim is very significant and very important because the motto for the World Council of Churches in these eight years is to be on a pilgrimage of justice and peace. And so I think Francis, you know, in, in a kind of a um, clear but somewhat oblique way is saying, you know, you're not just separated brothers and sisters. We're not just separated from one another. We're pilgrims on the same way. And I think that's a step in the, in, in, in the right direction. He talks about how trusting is an art and peace is an art. And he talks about and laments how the lack of unity impedes the spread of the gospel. And he says if we concentrate on the convictions we share, and if we keep in mind the principle of, hi of the hierarchy of truths, we will be able to progress decidedly towards common expressions of proclamation, service, and witness. And Francis has great words of wisdom for those who are engaged in interfaith dialogue. He says, yes, there are a lot of obstacles. In so many parts of the world, it's almost impossible to dialogue. And yet he said, the effort is absolutely necessary. It's part of the mission of the church to try and work uh, to, to foster interfaith dialogue. But he says, you know, inter, interfaith dialogue can never devolve into a relativism that would produce a kind of just a facile syncretism. You're okay, I'm okay, everybody's okay, you have the truth, I have the truth, we all have the truth. You know, it, it, this, this, that, that, there's, that we have an identity that we need to preserve. We need to be open. We need to learn. But we also need to stand for the truth. He says, true openness involves remaining steadfast in one's deepest convictions, clear and joyful in one's own identity, while at the same time being open to an understanding of those of the other party and knowing that dialogue can enrich each side. So I think these are words of wisdom indeed. Sixthly and finally, if we take Francis's dream of a missionary option seriously, we're going to have a church that is committed to contextualization. He says if we attempt to put all things in a missionary key, this will affect the way we communicate the message. I think Francis is very aware that the gospel message always needs to be suited to particular contexts and so connected with everyday life. It means, first of all, that the central aspect of the message, which is salvation in Christ, the tender and merciful love of God, this cannot be eclipsed by anything secondary. Uh, very soon after he became Pope, as I mentioned before, he gave an interview that was published in Jesuit magazines all over the world. And he used the image, I'm not so crazy about the, 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 the martial imagery, but he used the image of the church is like a field hospital after a battle. You know, it's like a mass unit. And, and, and you know, when, when people come in wounded and bleeding, you don't ask them, oh, how's your cholesterol? Or, or you know, what's your blood pressure? You heal the wounds. And he says, that's what we need to do. We need to cut to the center of things. You know, we have to, you know, preach the gospel in order to heal the wounds. So he says the message has to concentrate on the essentials of what's most beautiful, most grand, most appealing, 
and at the same time, the most necessary. Uh, last Pentecost, in his Angelus message, he always appears at the window of the Vatican at 12 noon every Sunday. And Pentecost Sunday, he, he, he said that our mission is to communicate first and foremost the merciful love of God to the world. So, second, he says, that that unchanging message needs to be communicated in a language which brings out our doctrines, our traditions, abiding newness. And he says we just can't repeat orthodox language. This is a passage I, I, I really like, uh, in, especially as a systematic theologian. You know, there are times when the faithful, in listening to completely orthodox language, take something alien to the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that language is alien to their own way of speaking to and understanding one another. So it's not, it's not just repeating the right words. So for Francis, context, and in particular, culture, is a, a locus theologicus, is a theological source that is worthy for the effective communication of the gospel. So our experience, our culture, must be in dialogue with our traditions, with our scriptures, and it's, 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 a, it's an equal way of understanding what the gospel, how the gospel should be expressed. And he says this explicitly about popular religion, popular piety. This is a theological source for the church. I think it's also true of context in general. So what he says is that the process of inculturation or contextualization is in itself the process of evangelization. No culture is perfect, he says. But he also says that, and this is, of course, an allusion to a, a, a medieval scholastic dictum, grace supposes nature. Grace supposes culture, he says. But he says that every culture needs purification. And particularly in profoundly secularized contexts, it will mean sparking new processes, we talked about this here, for evangelizing culture, even though, even though these will demand long-term planning. Nevertheless, evangelization joyfully acknowledges these very treasures which the Holy Spirit pours out upon the church. We would not, I love this phrase, we would not do justice to the logic of the incarnation if we thought Christianity as monocultural and monotonous. Just a few words of conclusion. Francis' dream of a church that embodies the reality of the gospel. That is a church of joy. That is a church that exudes God's mercy and tenderness. That has a deep concern for and solidarity with the poor. That is consumed by missionary zeal. That lives in simplicity of life. That has a baptismal consciousness. That is in dialogue this is a church where I think if we take his dream seriously, Francis is right. If we fulfill his dream of a missionary option, everything will change. Even the church will change. And I say even us, maybe even us. Thank you.
emphasizes that it's, uh, it lacks a certain breadth, that it appears um, often to be used uh, talking about sort of strategies and, uh, and processes that are designed to, to bring people to assent to the propositions of faith and to sit in church uh, pews. Would you, have you been, would you like to com comment on that and whether you've noticed that or that distinction elsewhere? Something, it's, it's something I, I uh, struggle with a bit. Uh, you know, I, I'm a member of the World Council of Churches Commission on Mission and Evangelism. And uh, I don't like that distinction. I think they're redundant, really. You know, I think that an evangelism has to be an integral evangelism. And I think a mission has to be an integral mission. Uh, and so I think that what evangelization is about, or evangelism, or mission, I think they're all the, the same thing, are, uh, as, as I've written, and I, I always quote John Paul II, mission, evangelization, is a single yet complex reality. Uh, it, it has many facets, and they're all constitutive of it. We need to witness to and to proclaim in humble boldness the gospel. We need to invite people into the church because we know that this is where there is abundant life. But mission evangelization is also about social justice. It's also about the care of creation. It's also about inculturation. It's also about interreligious dialogue. It's all of a piece. Because the goal of mission is not bringing people into the church. The goal of mission is to partner with God in bringing about, you know, as God only can bring about, the, the reign of God. You know, and, and so all these aspects are what we do as God's partners in helping that reign of God to take, to take flesh, um, uh, to take shape in, in our world. So that's how I see it. Uh, and that's why I don't like to say, well, evangelism is just, you know, you know making disciples. And then there's this other aspect. I think they're all of a piece, you know, and, and, and that I think that if we are a, a church that embodies the reign of God, you know, that is a foretaste uh, of, of, of the reign of God, a sign of the reign of God, as Leslie Newbegin would say, you know, that, 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 that people will be attracted because they want to join in the process of, of making this, this, this world, uh, a reality that reflects the, the peace and the love and the justice of God. In what ways do you think the Catholic Church would need to change its own structures in order to facilitate the movement to these rather splendid goals. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I think it. I think it really has to be pretty drastic. Um, and and I think in some ways, you know, if 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 you take Francis seriously, you know, especially that that line from from paragraph twenty seven, you know, everything has to serve the mission. I think the problem. I don't know what it's like in the Anglican Church, but the problem in the in the Roman Catholic Church is that you know um, uh, we serve the structure of the church. The, the the church in itself is the goal, you know, at least I mean, it, 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 you know, and, 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 and practically, uh, and and actually the structure has to serve the mission, you know. So what does that mean in terms of you know inclusivity across the board? You know, uh, what does that mean? Uh, 
uh, about you know so many um, so many accretions that have that have you know uh, I think weighed us down. Uh, I, I I think I think the structure of the church needs to needs to be developed to serve its mission. And if we can get that right, you know, I think that will be that will be drastic. You know, I, I and I, I I mean I think there are all sorts of ways that uh, uh, that that is the case. Um, when you first had that document in your hand and you read it, how did you react? How did you feel? What was your first response? It was unbelievable. I mean, it was just amazing. Uh, I happened to be the, the, the morning or the, the, the day that the document came out. I happened to be in Rome. Uh, and uh, I... I, I you know, it, it was just amazing to walk the streets of Rome and and know that this document uh, was out there. And the more I read it, uh, the more amazed I was. You know, uh, did, you feel joy? did you feel joy? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I was I was just really overjoyed. You know, absolutely. Great. Um, thank you, Stephen, for the the joy of your communication as well. Um, this, this uh, the enthusiasm that you put behind the enthusiasm of Francis is mm. very uh, addictive. Um, but with my historian's hat on, I know that every revolution usually involves blood on the floor. Of course. Um, and so I'm going to be rich <laughs> at, at, at this point. Uh, I'd ask you to, to comment a little bit on... Uh, it, it, it seems to me that if this were to happen, the only way is in fact for everyone to get on board. Yeah. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't actually see that happening in the Catholic Church or elsewhere. Um, therefore, could I ask you to, to take off the idealist optimist hat and put a realist hat on and say, how far do you think this could go, uh, given that the current Pope will not live forever, and who knows what his successor may or may not wish to take from this and continue on? How far do you think is realistic for us to, to, to hope as opposed to uh, set, the, set the bar too high? And, and, and of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a dream. I mean, and, and, and the Pope says that. Uh, and so it is, it is ideal. Just the fact that he dreams this way, I think, is, is pretty revolutionary. And it gives us missiologists, uh, you know, some... Uh, 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 some uh, grist for our mill, so to speak. You know, I mean, it, we can actually quote documents and and uh, and, and 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 call for uh, uh, call for this kind of thing. Um, but you're right. I mean, and there's a lot of opposition to this. I mean, there are. You know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who was in Rome about two weeks ago. Uh, at a at a conference, and it was a more of a conservative Catholic conference. And he said, you know, the French bishops are all against this. You know, they think that Francis is betraying doctrine, and uh, you know this this kind of thing. Uh, I think people who have um, you know under particularly the the latter Pope John Paul II and Benedict the Sixteenth. You know, when cardinals began wearing ermine fur, you know, or ermine capes and uh, long trains and watered silk and all that stuff, I mean, they worked hard to get there. <laughs> you know, and it's really hard for them to give that up. You know, and and so there's a there's a certainly a, a lot of of, uh, of 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 pushback uh, in 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 this regard. But I think Francis, and I think, and I'm going to say I hope at the, at the same time, I mean, this is a big titanic to turn around, isn't it? I mean, the, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's big. It's big. <laughs> 
but that just came out. <laughs> that came out of Mr. Stephen as well. But, uh, but uh, um, uh, uh, I think Francis is also pretty shrewd. Uh, I, I, I read recently a, a wonderful book uh, by a, a British journalist named Austin Ivory. I don't know if you've ever, it's, it, uh, if you've seen the book, it's called The Great Reformer. And, uh, and he kind of shows how uh, as provincial uh, in, uh, in Argentina and, and so he, he was reforming all the time. And this Archbishop of Buenos Aires uh, particularly. And he knows what he's doing. And I think that little by little, and probably it's a lot behind the scenes, you know, he's changing things. Um, I think what's really going to be crucial is the appointment of bishops. I think what we see already is his appointment of cardinals, where he's appointing cardinals all from the majority world. Very, very few from Europe and from North America and you know uh, in Australia and, 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 and New Zealand. I mean, there is one, of course, John Jew in uh, in, in uh, uh, Wellington, uh, but uh, uh, which is a kind of I mean, in some ways, that was a really interesting thing because John John Jew is an amazing bishop, uh, but he's 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 I think getting his people in key positions. But he's doing it, you know, like you turn the Titanic. You know, he's not he's not trying to make it an Alfa Romeo sports car, you know, that to just you know turn on a dime. I think he's really I think he knows what he's doing and he's and he's kind of working for this for this kind of thing. You're right. I mean he's what 79 years old now. You know? Uh, and uh, he probably doesn't have a long time, and he, and he says he probably will resign at, at, a, at a certain point. But I think he might be setting things up, I, and this is, I think and I hope, he's setting things up for a successor to continue his work. It's a, if I say it again, it's a big job. This is a big work to do this. But I think he's really started, and I think he's really serious. And I think, I think anyway, the response of the world at large is on his side. You know, and and so I, I, uh, I, 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 as I say, it's a, it's it's you know my best thinking in this regard, and and a, a real hope in this regard. But I realize that that this is an ideal. But you know. We got to talk about this. You know, we I, we have to <clears throat> we have to say this is really what the church needs to be. You know, is not something that's centered on itself, but rather centered on the reign of God. You know, and that it's it should shape itself uh, uh, in order to serve that and not to serve itself. <coughs> I, Last question, John. Um, Stephen, thank you very much for a really inspiring presentation. And can I just ask you, wearing your WCC hat, um, okay. uh, Together Towards Life was a, yes. a, 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 a mission statement out of the WCC, which in, in a way was also um, showed enormous movement um, on from the Reformed and Protestant traditions of the church. I'm just wondering, uh, wearing your hat, where do you see the potential synergies between what's happening in the Roman Catholic Church and what's also happening um, uh, amongst the Protestant reform traditions of the church? Uh, thank you, John. So, a good question. Um, um, unfortunately, um, Together Towards Life did not uh, influence Evangelii Gaudium at all. Um, and of course, Evangelii Gaudium did not influence Together Towards Life at all because that's a you know a, a larger, longer, it's like a, a six-year process. Uh, uh, and and um, <clears throat> Together Towards Life, which if you haven't read the WCC mission statement, it's really marvelous. It's it's really fantastic. Uh, 
very spirit-centered, very creation-centered. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful document. Uh, it was finally approved by the WCC at its assembly in Busan, um, just at the, uh, uh, it, it was like about November 4th, 2000, uh, uh, 2013. Uh, Evangelii Gaudium came out um, November 24th or November 26th, something like that. You know, so so they're they're two parallel. I think there are some interesting connections, particularly in terms of the poor. I think together towards life is much stronger. On it talks about how we we shouldn't do mission from the center to the margins, but we should allow the margins to evangelize us, and that's the the, the new way of, of thinking about mission. I think Francis is still in the you know the older kind of of model, but he still has a phrase that's very similar in, in, uh, in to the Together Towards Life, which is, the poor need to evangelize us. We need to listen to the poor. You know, and, and so that phrase is there. The, 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 some of the economic issues, uh, some of the issues on dialogue and things like that, they're, they're, they're very compatible. Uh, Francis's document is much more Christocentric than Together Towards Life. Um, just in the last several days, uh, the latest issue of the uh, Commission on World Mission and Evangelism's uh, 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 journal, uh, the International Review of Mission, uh, has been published. And this, this issue, uh, I co-edited it with uh, the, uh, the, the, the secretary of the, uh, of the CWME, uh, uh, a Korean, uh, a Presbyterian by the name of jo Joseph Kuhn. Uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, the theme of the, uh, of, of the issue is Evangelii Gaudium in dialogue. And what we did was we, <clears throat> we, we focused on Evangelii Gaudium. So the first part, we have five Catholics summarize Evangelii Gaudium. But then in the second part, we have Pentecostals, Orthodox, uh, uh, mainline Protestants, uh, Anglicans, uh, Catholics, Roman Catholics, uh, uh, looking at various themes. But we also added uh, a, a dialogue with the uh, Lausanne movement's uh, Cape Town commitment, which was done in 2000, uh, 2010. And so it's a wonderful document, I think, which really puts these three major mission documents of our era in a, in a kind of a trilogue. So I think you'll see some of the connections uh, in, in this particular issue. I'm, I'm really excited about this, uh, about this issue. Another thing is, the, um, this is just an aside, but uh, uh, later this month, the executive committee of the CWME is meeting in Rome, and they're going to have a, 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 an audience with the Pope. And they're going to formally present the Pope with a copy of this, uh, or the, this, this issue. So I'm really excited that uh, you know, he'll have something that I've done in his hand. <laughs> 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 Professor Stephen, I've got the privilege of thanking you on behalf of everyone, and uh, and I can't take responsibility for how you've affected each person, but I know that you have stirred us up. And uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Australian movie The Castle, but there's, there's an iconic um, uh, phrase in it about the vibe. And for me, who has travelled through this conference, you have caught the vibe of what is happening conference, but also the vibe of, I think, what is happening in the church by bringing Pope Francis to us, and what Steve, Bishop Stephen has talked about in reclaiming language. That's how I listened to you this evening as you brought us that wisdom, and even the title, containing the words dreaming and missionary option, and I'm thinking, I've never been to a public lecture in the church with that as part of the title. And that was a good beginning. 
and just listing the language of dialogue and openness that I hope is now part of the shift and reformation with a little R in the church. Um, things like impulse, transforming, embrace, listening, going further, not afraid, taking the risk, leaving the security, mercy and tenderness, the revolution of tenderness, religious care, never heard those two words put together, taking a stance, equality and accessibility, missionary power, missionary communion, striking out new paths, culture of encounter, opening to listening and clear values. I thank you for helping us shift for each person here in whatever way that has happened to bring inspiration and to be a missionary disciple amongst us. So thank you. Thank you very much.